Hello there, my name is Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. For the longest time, for the longest time I've wanted to do a video on Bluetooth mesh and now that I have the Thingy 53, and I do hope you've had a chance to watch my introductory video to the Thingy 53. Now that I have the Thingy 53, I'm able to do a video about Bluetooth mesh that includes an actual demo, which of course makes things a whole bunch more interesting. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. Okay, so as I said, we're going to be looking at Bluetooth mesh and we're going to be using the Thingy 53 uh, at the end for a quick demo of Bluetooth mesh in action. Now, you are probably familiar with Bluetooth, right? I mean, it's kind of pretty much everywhere uh, and you've probably used it when you want to connect a pair of wireless headphones, Bluetooth headphones to uh, maybe your smartphone, maybe to a laptop, and maybe you've also used it for Bluetooth keyboards and Bluetooth mice. So these are all examples of what's called Bluetooth Classic. So whenever you use your headphones, keyboards, mice, Bluetooth Classic, uh, and that's really the first type of Bluetooth that came along. However, there's a second type of Bluetooth, which is called Bluetooth Low Energy or Bluetooth LE or just BLE. It's separate and different from Bluetooth Classic. There's no compatibility between the two. You can't connect a Bluetooth Classic device to a Bluetooth low energy device. However, they do coexist. Many chipsets, many smartphones, many laptops support both Bluetooth Classic and Bluetooth uh, low energy. And the most common use at the moment of Bluetooth low energy for the consumer field, of course, is sort of smart watches or fitness trackers. They normally use Bluetooth low energy to talk to your smartphone or whatever. For, for measuring how many steps you've done, your heartbeat and, and all that kind of stuff. Now, all of what we've just talked about are examples of point-to-point -point communication, whether that's Bluetooth Classic or Bluetooth LE. So headphones, fitness trackers, they all communicate with one other device, likely your smartphone or your laptop, in a point-to-point, one-to-one fashion. So here's your headphones and it connects to your smartphone, your fitness tracker, talks to your smartphone and so on. Now, mesh is not a one-to-one -one system, it's a many to many system. In a mesh network, the communications are many to many, not just one to one. And Bluetooth mesh, as a technology, uses Bluetooth low energy to build these mesh networks. So here's an example of just, you know, generic nodes in a mesh network. This one here can talk to this one and this one, but it doesn't necessarily talk directly to this one. However, if it goes through this, it can get to this. This one, uh, can talk to this one, but it can't talk to this one, but it can through that one and so on. So with a mesh network, it's many to many and there are multiple routes, multiple ways to get to any one spot from when it, another spot. And that's the idea of a mesh network. Of course, that's great for reliability and for multiple paths and for failure. If one node fails, the whole network doesn't fail and so on. So why would you want to use a mesh network? Why would you want to use Bluetooth mesh? Well, you get to cover a large area because not each thing in the network has to be within radio range of other things. As long as there's something in radio range, then the message can get there through these different routes that I was just talking about. It handles a large number of devices. It's based on Bluetooth low energy, so it's got low energy consumption. It's an efficient use of the radio resources, which is great when you've got scalability. Uh, and it's compatible because it's based on Bluetooth LE. It's really a software layer on top, a protocol layer. Then of course it's compatible with smartphones uh, and tablets and personal computer products today that already have Bluetooth LE. In fact, uh, with the Thingy 53, you can talk to the Thingy 53 over Bluetooth LE and in fact start a mesh network uh, kind of demo going just from your current uh, smartphone, your Android or your iOS smartphone. So that's absolutely great. Now, Bluetooth Mesh uses what's called a publish subscriber system. That means devices may send messages to addresses whose names and meanings correspond to high level concepts, which users can understand, like garden lights. This is called publishing. So you send a message towards the garden lights topic. Devices can be configured to receive messages from those particular addresses. This is called subscribing. So one device pushes it out and another device says, I'm listening for those kind of things. When a device publishes a message to a particular address, all the other devices that subscribe to that address will receive a copy of it. They process it and react in some way. So imagine a set of outdoor lights installed in the garden. Each light has been configured so that it's subscribed to the garden lights message. 
Now imagine a Bluetooth mesh light switch. It sends a switch on and on message to the garden lights group and all the lights in the garden will receive the on message and switch on. So you don't have to say, you know, you have to configure this one talks to this one and this one talks to this one. You just say, no, I'm part of the garden lights. I'm subscribing to that and it, it all works. Now, the other important thing is that mesh networks allow devices to be installed and communicate over a very large area. Think shopping malls, airports, office blocks. And then with walls and other physical barriers, it may not be possible to have direct radio contact from every node, as I showed you in that diagram. A Bluetooth mesh network solves this problem by allowing some of the devices in the network to be relays. So what that happens then is you can have a light for example, which is powered by the main, so that's absolutely no problem. And it can act as a relay and it can send on the messages it receives further on down the network. Same for light switches, you can have dedicated relay devices. So the network can support big distances, multiple routes, because these uh, nodes in the network know how to transmit the messages further on. And this is handled in a way that's called uh, managed flooding. So all relay enabled devices that receive a message retransmit that message to every other radio in its range. Flooding has the advantage that there are no need for a particular device to have special responsibility to act as a centralized router. It's not like, you know, maybe on an ethernet or you're at Wi-Fi at home, you have your Wi-Fi access point or you have your ethernet switch. And if that goes down, nothing can talk to each other. The flooding approach means that there are general, generally multiple paths by which messages can be carried to their destination. And this makes a reliable network. Now, there are some stuff built in there. So obviously, if a, if a node has received a message before and then it receives it again because it received it from somebody else nearby, it keeps a local cache and doesn't send it again. So it's managed flooding, not total flooding. So the whole network just gets out of control. It's managed flooding so that only what needs to be sent on further on is actually sent. Okay, now I said we'll be using the Thingy 53. I've got another video here on this channel talking about the Thingy 53 in more depth. It's from Nordic Semiconductors using their processor, which has also Bluetooth built into it. In fact, we'll look some more at what it can do. The Nordic 53 is a multi-sensor prototyping platform for matter, machine learning, Bluetooth, Bluetooth mesh, and other IoT protocols. It's got a dual core called its M33, two processors, and this is the RF5340 system on a chip. It has integrated sensors for motion, light, sound, environmental factors. One of the called its M33 handles any computational tasks that you need to have, and that's the application core. It runs 128 megahertz, one megabyte of flash, 512K of RAM. But the other core handles wireless connectivity. It runs at a slightly lower clock rate, 64 megahertz, got less RAM and flash, but it's there to be able to handle all the wireless stuff. So you don't have to worry about the main processor being able to also catch all the you know things that are coming in on all the different interfaces it's got because it supports quite a lot of radio interfaces there. It dedicated, their own dedicated core that does that. Okay, so now it's time for a demo to see Bluetooth mesh in action. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take three Nordic 53s, okay, and we're gonna configure two of them to be lights. And you can do all this configuration and provisioning, which is where you add something to a network, you say what group you're subscribing to, you do that through a mobile phone app. And this is a demo that if you were dev developing a system, an ecosystem for this, all the stuff is already here, examples and how it would all work. And you could very quickly build yourself up a, uh, a commercial or, or an open source even, if whatever you wanted to do, a uh, system for doing Bluetooth mesh. So two of them are gonna be uh, lights, and one of them's gonna be a light switch. And it's not that revolutionary in the sense that you turn on the light switch, and the two lights will come on. Of course, it's all done by Bluetooth, no wires attached, and they're talking to each other, and it just works. So let's have a look at that. Okay, there you have it, Bluetooth mesh and the Thingy 53. Now, for you film buffs out there, what film starring Dudley Moore do you find an apartment that was advertised with IOL, instant on lighting? Do let me know in the comments below. I do hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. If you like these kind of videos, why not stick around by subscribing to the channel? Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.